pleasure now of introducing our keynote speaker for the evening, uh, another one of our amazing alumni, um, Dr. George Gleckler, who has come from Maryland to speak with our scholar community, and his lovely wife, Christine, who is also a Pullman scholar. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the chance to see their story in the annual report. It's, I like to think of it as the Pullman Foundation love story, in addition to a variety of other things. Um, George and Christine were both students at the University of Chicago. Uh, George studying physics and Christine studying mathematics, and I understand that Christine worked in the foundation's office, and that's how they happened to meet. Um, Dr. Gleckler has gone on to um, an amazingly impressive career as a scientist for NASA, um, working on both the space shuttle uh, Ulysses and also um, the Odyssey, correct? Oh, I'm sorry, Voyager, my apologies. Um, this has been, um, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's also a longtime foundation supporter. Um, we are very honored to have him here tonight to talk about his, um, his life journey, which started in um, the Ukraine and then ended up bringing him here to Chicago and, um, and a life of really remarkable achievements. So Dr. Gleckler, if you would join me at the podium. Pullman scholars, Pullman scholar alumni, guests, and the nice Pullman staff, good evening. I'm deeply honored and especially delighted to be with you tonight. And at this point, I better put on my glasses because I can't see so well. First, to celebrate your extraordinary achievements as Pullman scholars, but also to take this opportunity to share some aspects of my journey to become a Pullman scholar and the path that I have traveled since. I hope in the process to give you some insights and bits of advice on your career journey. So let me share with you what the path was like for me in early life and later in building my career. And by way of contrast, what it was like for Bill Hammett, a high school classmate, sorry, okay, uh, a high school classmate of mine, and Bill is right here in the audience. And I must say, uh, Bill helped me a lot with this talk, and I appreciate this. Five points I will present you with tonight. Points that I have called from my and Bill's experiences. A difficult early life can serve as preparation, not necessarily as impediment to a successful career in life. Find and cultivate mentors who can guide and support your journey. Find a life's work that will spark passion. Love what you do. It will be the main force that propels and guides you in critical life decision. Four, as you impress people with your talent, your hard work, your sincerity, they will arrive at a critical point to help you define and achieve your goals. And five, aim first for success an accomplishment in your life's work. Recognition rewards will follow. And finally, most importantly, find a life's work that will spark passion. I, I said this, didn't I? Uh, well, it must be very important then. I try not to repeat myself unless I need to emphasize a point. I'm a space scientist investigating the nature, substances, particles, and dynamics of our solar system based upon the universal laws of physics. Space scientists do this to advance our knowledge of the cosmic environment from whence we come and its future import to our survival and prosperity. My work is fascinating and deeply satisfying. 
To illustrate how I got to do this work, I start at the beginning of my life. My childhood years were often difficult. Odessa, Ukraine, where I was born in 1937, was under Stalin's communist regime. Food was scarce. Food was scarce and many perished from starvation. My mother's sudden death when I was three was for me most traumatic. My memories of her are still poignant and painful. Life in Odessa improved during the few years of Romanian occupation with the yoke of communism lifted Free enterprise flourished and food was abundant. All this came to an abrupt end when my family fled as the Soviet army was on the verge of retaking Odessa. We started our nightmarish journey west with the Red Army all the time nipping at our heels. I was six at the time. Our journey of many months took us to a refugee camp in Romania. From there, by cattle car train through Romania, through Hungary, Czechoslovakia, to German-occupied Poland. Twice each day, the train stopped, allowing a brief moment to cook a meal with food brought to us by generous local people. During this journey, I witnessed bombings and people being horribly injured and killed. For about a month, life returned to normal while we occupied a single family house in the town of Gnezen, Poland. But then the Russians were coming again and we fled again, this time by train, in a passenger car packed to the limit with children, adults, and their few belongings. Our destination was a farm near the small town of Dingolfing, Bavaria, a place chosen by my father who calculated that the U.S. would occupy that region of Germany. We settled in a large room on the second floor of a barn with my uncle's family. Toilets were outdoors and there was no running water. Food was rationed. All of us scavenged recently harvested fields for potatoes and grains and also nearby woods for firewood and berries. After the war ended, we resettled in a displaced persons camp at the outskirts of Dingolfing. This is when we experienced firsthand American generosity. Care packages filled with clothing and other goodies were distributed. I was most fascinated with the nice smell of American soap. My primary education began in Dingolfing at the age of eight, starting with private tutoring by my great uncle and ending in the middle school or gymnasium in the lovely city of Lanshut, 40 minutes by train from Dingolfing. Life in post-war Germany was difficult. With job being scarce, my father couldn't find full-time employment. Our future in Germany looked bleak to him, so he quickly applied for immigration to the USA. In November 1951, our family of five arrived in Chicago. A few weeks later, having completed elementary school, I entered Crane Technical High School. The next leg of my formative journey was about to begin. As I recall the struggles of the preceding period and of my early childhood, I'm thankfully aware that a difficult early life can serve as preparation, not necessarily as impediment to a successful career in life. 66 years ago, Bill Hammett and I were Crane classmates in Mr. Gammetsfelder's home section. Bill reminds me that he takes primary credit for my success at Crane as he served as my interpreter I couldn't speak English all that well then, and understanding was even more difficult. My interpreter of critical class information dispensed by Mr. Gammers Felder on the starting day. For this, I forever remain indebted to Bill. 
Bill and I, like all of you, have many talents. Bill had, without realizing it then, more than I, and his were far more diverse than mine. Doing well in our classes, we impressed our excellent teachers, and especially our two most helpful guidance counselors, Mrs. Cullen and Mrs. Morrissey. Our four years together found us both at the top of our class. My top was a tad higher than Bill's, but that was okay with him since he reasoned he was 16 months my junior. Near the end of our high school education, we both had little idea what to do next, but going to college was not something we had in mind. Our counselors, however, insisted that we continue our education. And in Bill's case, Mrs. Cullen badgered him into agreeing to go to college. For us, engineering was a natural choice since Crane prepared us so well for a technical career. I applied to the Illinois Institute of Technology as well as to the University of Chicago. U of C was first to offer me admission and I immediately accepted, not knowing that Chicago did not have an engineering program. <laughs> Literally days before spring semester started, Mrs. Cullen arranged for Bill's admission to IIT. Our counselors also insisted that we apply to the Pullman Educational Foundation. I did, and it was awarded a scholarship. Bill chose not to apply, owing to his lingering reservations he had about pursuing a college education. However, when he finally acquiesced, days before classes began, he figured that his 30-hour-per-week job, together with financial support from his family and church, took care of his tuition and living expenses. So I call him. I could have been Pullman Scholar since, had he so chosen, I'm convinced he would have been one. A big reason we started college was because we impressed our counselors who gave support and guidance at a critical point in our lives. As I continue with our stories, you will see this over and over and over again. Impress people with your talents, your substance, your hard work and your sincerity, and they will help you define and achieve your goals. And your success becomes their success too. Bill and I started our higher education on February 1956, I at U of C majoring in physics, and Bill at IIT majoring in engineering. The University of Chicago was in the quarter system, but had a special arrangement for students entering mid-year. Our small freshman class included Pullman scholar Christine Giambalo, soon to be my wife, and she's right there. Despite strong protests from both our families, we were married at the U of C Bond Chapel on September 20th, 1958, just about one month after our 21st birthday so our parents couldn't stop us. <laughs> Immediately after receiving my BS degree, John Simpson uh, offered to take me on as one of his PhD students, an offer I hoped for and gladly accepted. The research assistantships, all of them arranged by Simpson, covered tuition and living expenses. As Simpson's graduate student, my main responsibility was to organize and supervise the construction, testing, and calibration of one of Simpson's satellite instruments. And I loved doing that. In 1965, I was awarded my PhD degree. My formal education was finished, and I embarked on my professional career as research associate in Simpson's group. Now, this was the most enjoyable period of my career. No more courses, no more exams. I could do the work I loved and plan for the future. By the end of my second year, I was offered and accepted the position of assistant professor at the physics and astronomy department at the University of Maryland. In the summer of 1967, Chris and I, with our two Siamese cats, Smirnov and Bacardi, <laughs> left Chicago and drove in our VW Beetle to College Park, Maryland. 
I was eager to start, never imagining that my tenure in Maryland would last for 39 years. Twelve years ago, I retired as distinguished university professor, the highest ranking faculty position offered at the university. In 2003, I began my association with the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, first as adjunct professor. I could do that while still working at Maryland. And then in 2006, as part-time research professor, my current appointment. And now I'm happier than ever doing full-time what I really love, which is to do instrument design and analyze spacecraft data. As Pullman scholars, you are now at various stages in your higher education. No matter at what stage you are, ask yourself, do I or will I enjoy my work? Does my chosen career spark or fulfill a passion? Now, these are not always easy questions to answer, and sometimes it takes time and help to find the answer. I urge you not to be afraid to seek career counseling and be prepared to switch course if necessary. Look for another career and keep looking until you find one that makes you happy, one who will satisfy your passion. To achieve this goal may be a straightforward progression, or it may not be. It was one for me, not so for Bill. Bill started his higher education at IIT, majoring in engineering. Almost immediately, he was not happy, began to have doubts about engineering as a career. Taking time off to reflect on what to do next, he discovered music, learning to play the piano and enjoying it. At the insistence of his piano teacher, Bill enrolled in the Chicago Conservatory College of Music and supported by scholarships throughout, earned his bachelor's and master's of music degrees. Next, he enrolled at Roosevelt University where he took graduate courses in musicology, music history, music education, and public education to qualify for a public school teaching certificate. After all, he had to eventually earn a living and find the job. He also squeezed in an occasional course as well as tutoring in human development and counseling. So Bill was now ready to finally start his career teaching music in public schools. But then another employment opportunity was presented to him. A friend who supervised the treatment program at a residential children's facility persuaded him to take a position as a social worker and counselor. That appealed to Bill, having studied and taken an interest in human behavior. He enjoyed his work at the treatment facility, working with 16 adolescent charges assigned to him. After two years at this position, he took employment in the Department of Social Services at the Michael Reese Hospital. For another few years, Bill labored hard at social services and counseling, but it soon became apparent he needed the formal credentials to continue and advance in his work. Bill's supervisor counseled him on the necessity of returning to school for advanced training, and towards this end, she advocated on his behalf to the hospital and university and was largely responsible for his matriculation in 1969 at the University of Chicago School of Social Services. With a full scholarship from the hospital, a full training fellowship from the university, and an additional sum from the Jewish Children's Bureau, Bill's income now exceeded even his salary at Michael Rees, removing any economic arguments he might have proffered owing to his support obligation for a wife and two children. At the University of Chicago, Bill changed his focus from human development and treatment to the more administrative and management-oriented specialty of social policy and planning. Bill earned his advanced degree and necessary credential and in 1971 returned to Michael Reese as hospital administrator. 
The next 24 years at Michael Reese were rewarding and very satisfying for him. Bill was doing work he loved and was given recognition and promotion. He climbed the administrative ladder, assuming more and more responsibilities. At the same time, he also engaged in extensive teaching. All this came to an abrupt end when Michael Reese was sold to a for-profit entity. Bill left and took administrative and faculty positions at the social at the School of Public Health and the Medical College at the University of Illinois at Chicago, not far from here. The next 12 years in academia as assistant professor in public health, associate dean, and dean of students in the medical school were the pinnacle of Bill's career. As dean of students, he was responsible for programs of academic guidance career counseling and general support to an enrollment of about 1,000 of the best and brightest and most demand demanding medical students. Working over 60 hours a week as instructor for two to three classes per academic years, as a medical school administrator, he clearly relished his final career appointment. Bill retired in 2006, is now deeply involved in art photography in his studio at home, and has returned to music and multiple renovation and maintenance tasks of his home for which Crane's shop, shop courses prepared him so well. Bill's career is an example of how mentors and interested supporters can make the difference in one's life and career and that multiple course corrections, when needed, can still find the path to success and gratification in one's life's work. So now I would like to give you a deeper review of some highlights of my work, my involvement in two historic space missions, Voyager and Ulysses. These in many ways represent the pinnacle of my career. The mission of the Voyager 1 and 2 space probes initially conceived in the 1960s was to study the outer planets, Jupiter and Saturn, during close flybys. To reach both of these giants required that they be properly aligned, something that occurred only during a month-long period every 100 years or so. This mandated a launch of both spacecraft in the summer of 1977. Both space probes of what is now called the Interstellar Voyager mission are still operational after all these years, proceeding to the outer regions of our solar system, with Voyager 1 now over 13 billion miles from our sun, and Voyager 2 not far behind at over 10 billion miles. Both voyages carry our LECP instrument that's shown on the left there, and, and these instruments are providing critical data. The spacecraft remains in continuing communication with NASA. Now I turn to the other mission, Ulysses. It's a solar satellite launched in October 1990 to orbit the sun at all latitudes. That was the first. Serendipitous intersections of comet tails provide additional signs. Ulysses, having orbited the sun three times, decommit was decommissioned in June 2009, uh, nearly 19 years after it was launched. So on board was our SWIX instrument, that's shown on the right there on top. That's what it looks like. And SWIX stands for Solar Wind Iron Composition Spectrometer, an instrument I conceived about eight years after my arrival at Maryland. This device measures the mass, electronic charge, and energy of positively charged atoms and molecules in space. SWIX measures critical parameters of the thermal solar wind, as well as the associated superthermal tails, also observed with LECP. 
the solar winds with their superthermal tails are massive sweeps of accelerated particles emanating from the sun and extending billions of miles across the solar system. In the interest of clarity and time, I will condense much of the scientific con conversation related to this project to their purposes and simple outcomes, concentrating on the details of work and people involved. My lifelong association with the Voyager mission started five years after I moved to Maryland when in August 1972, Tom Cremigius, he was Van Allen's student, and I proposed the Low Energy Charged Particle Instrument, LECP for short, on the left again. That was proposed for NASA's ambitious, high-profile MGS, Mariner, Jupiter, Saturn, 77 launch, launch year mission to fly close by and thus explore first Jupiter and Saturn. We were then young kids competing with the established scientists, including Simpson, Chicago, and Van Allen, Iowa, our represent respective mentors. We were selected with some help, help from a, a fellow named Mike Mitz at NASA headquarters. And my space physics group uh, built portions of the LSCP instrument. After completing close flybys of all the outer planets, NASA was persuaded to continue operation of both voyagers with a new goal of determining the shape and the size of the so-called solar bubble, the vast solar gas region contained within an impenetrable magnetic membrane or wall within our solar system. Forty years after launch, our LACP instruments on each of the spacecraft are working perfectly to this day, and our measurements are essential to achieving the new goals of the Voyager interstellar mission. Then on August 25, 2012, something unexpected happened. The particles that LACP was measuring on Voyager 1 vanished in a matter of hours. This in itself was not surprising since it was one of the signs that Voyager 1 has crossed the wall and entered into stellar space. What was surprising was this occurred so soon. Several months later, NASA announced to the world that Voyager 1 crossed the boundary of our solar system and was now exploring interstellar space heading toward other destinations. A historic achievement and reason for global celebration on so momentous an occasion. But is Voyager 1 now really in interstellar space? My principal colleague, Len Fisk, and I have argued for some time that the NASA Voyager PI model shown on top, upon which the Voyager's positions in space are determined, is fatally flawed since it cannot account for all of the available observations needed to definitely place its position in space, in particularly those of the interstellar magnetic field strength and direction. So we proposed an alternative model uh, shown at the bottom. Uh, and in this model, uh, we, we claim that on 25th of August, 2012, Voyager 1 crossed a fence rather than the electromagnetic wall. So Voyager 1, we claim, has not yet entered into stellar space. And we project that this momentous event will, will occur in a few years from now or perhaps sooner. So imagine, if you will, the scientific implications should our model prevail. It proposes no less an alternative view of the structure and behavior of critical aspects of our solar system. And if our model is wrong, well, we still will have learned something of value such enigmas are the stuff of frontier science. 
Finally, I will describe my most enjoyable collaboration with Johannes Geis in building the Swix instrument on Ulysses and my election to the US National Academy of Sciences, enabled by Geis. Crucial to the recognition and use of Swix in satellites and probes was my colleague, Johannes Geis. Before he retired, Geis, 11 years my junior, my senior, my, my senior, he is older than I am, was a world-class Swiss scientist with great influence in the conduct of European space, uh, space science program. Sometime in 1985, I was able to meet and persuade him on the merits and innovative possibilities of SWIX. Upon seeing the utility of SWIX in intrasolar exploration, he decided to collaborate with me and pave the way for including SWIX on the NASA ESA Ulysses space probe that orbited the sun and it operated from 1990 to 2006. To create SWIX was a real challenge, requiring inventions of new technologies. Over and over again, seasoned experts told us that SWIX could not be built, and even if we managed to do so, it would not survive the launch. And even if it did, SWIX would never work properly. We ignored all this, these, those na naysayers, and pushed ahead. At the end, we succeeded. Another bit of advice, if you truly believe in your innovative ideas, your challenges to the tradition and the status quo, you should stand up for them and seek supporters to help you. SWIX was launched and performed beautifully. SWIX data were unprecedented and allowed us to publish numerous seminal papers in Science and Nature magazines, which reached a broad audience of scientists. My career at this juncture was in full swing. Success, it seemed, had be the path to my door. But of course, this was merely the fruits of hard work, innovative exploration, and the support of mentors and colleagues, most of all my dear wife, Chris. Two such colleagues were soon to have a big role in my career. David Schramm, an esteemed University of Chicago astrophysicist and Johannes Geis. They proved instrumental in my receiving the greatest professional honor election to the National Academy of Sciences. Only the Nobel Prize, in my judgment, exceeds it. My stream of publications, reflecting the depth of my contribution to astrophysical science, had apparently impressed Schramm. With his strong support and Geis's persistence advocacy, I was elected in 1997 to this august body. I was dumbstruck, but deeply humbled. My election came as a big surprise to many at the University of Maryland. Suddenly, I became a real, really valuable to the university. My salary doubled. That was my fortune. And finally, in, in closing, I would merely cite for you once again a piece of advice. Aim for success and accomplishments, recognitions, and rewards will follow. And the rest of my advice is given here, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Gleckler. Just a small token oh, of our nice. appreciation. You've had an amazing journey, and you really embody the, the true story of a Pullman scholar. Well, from... you know, I, I must say that Without Pullman, Chris and I just wouldn't have made it. And I and you was, wouldn't have met. We wouldn't have <laughs> met and all that. And you know, as you know, we've been supporters of the Pullman Foundation. Yes. And I want to announce here that we'll make another $50,000 gift. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. That's fabulous. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.